networking, um, going to a place, seeing Mike out and about, always gracious, always polite, always courteous. I'm always in people's face with my camera. Let's take a picture. He never shied me away. He was always humble. Um, Mr. Mike Berry also, um, the film that is upcoming is still going to come, Pieces of Me, he came and gave some tidbits of information with Dr. Pavilion Tyree. He came, um, and I see him going, I said, what you doing here? I said, Mr. Mike Berry here giving information, then we're going to be in good hands. So I'm going to give the mic over to him. Thank you for coming. How y'all doing? How y'all doing this morning? Hi, right, my name is Mike Berry. I advocate for mental health as I myself have been dealing with depression 25 years and this morning. So before I get started, I want to ask y'all a question. Am I the only person in here dealing with depression? No. no. Thoughts of stress and too much aggression. I can't sleep, my head filled with negative suggestions. Like Mike, you a loser, you not worthy of a blessing. You should step off the edge and go back to the essence. So I'm laying on the couch telling the doctor my confessions. Do they really care insurance paying for the sessions? I tell my friends about depression, how it's attacking my head. I'm sincere when I say it, they think I'm acting instead. Sometimes I want to get a gun and go back to the shed. Put a crack in my head, I just get back in the bed. I'm telling y'all depression, it can hit on the whim. At the beach for a swim, working out in the gym. I was shopping for shoes, I will eat some food. First some happiness, crashing my mood. My girl rubbing on my back, trying her best to soothe. I'm like, stop it, quit it, you aggravating, move. She like Mike, but I love you, and I'll always be here. But it's a whole different set of words I hear in my ear. She like Mike, I love you, and I'll always be here. But I hear Mike, you bum you, won't you disappear? See, while everybody else is out smiling and laughing, my happy keep crashing, I hate that with a passion. Sometimes I'm down on my knees, I'm looking up and I'm asking, are you my savior, are you my assassin? Every day I wake up, sometimes I feel sad and worthless, but every day above the surface is another day in my purpose. Right. So we get everything I just said in these verses. God got a plan for us all, and I'm working. So sad or no, when depression show, don't let it red light you, all you do is go. Cause I'm gonna tell you all something, you gotta remember this fact. You only get one life, so you gotta work around that. Oh. You know, if one more room like this, I look around, man, I see some beautiful people, y'all wearing nice clothes, nice hair, nice shoes, nice nails, but I know that some of y'all is wearing real pain. And unfortunately, you can't go home, reach into a closet, and pull off a hanger that says new feelings. Sometimes you got to wear the feelings you have right now. See, we take for granted that we happy, we take for granted a lot of things. Yeah. You took for granted that you was gonna wake up this morning. You set your clock last night with full intention on waking up this morning. Come the, on, reason, honey. the reason is because you've done it so many times before. Yeah. When you swung your legs off the bed onto the floor, you knew they was gonna work. Mm -hmm. When you got up and walked to the bathroom and picked up the toothpaste, you knew your hands was gonna work. When you looked at yourself in the mirror, you just knew you were gonna be able to see. One day I woke up and I felt like my happy was broke. All my life I've been happy, but one day I woke up, I felt like I was grieving, almost like my girlfriend had broke up with me. And that was 25 years ago and I've been dealing with that ever since. Mm. See, sometimes we, we look into a mirror and we like what we see, but we don't like who we see. Hmm. But when we walk out into the world, we got a nice car, we got a name on the door, we got a, a, a title on the desk and we get Oh, you so great. Oh, you this, oh, you that. But when you go home and it's just you and your feelings, uh, you don't know how they feel that way. Right. Okay. And when you're dealing with depression, depression is sometimes, I, I, I say depression sometimes feel like I'm drowning and I just won't die. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm drowning and I just won't die. I used to feel like I was the only person in the whole world that felt this way. And that's why I advocated because not only I'm a man, and society tells men, man, you, you can't go out there and tell somebody that you feel weak today. You can't go out to the world and tell somebody that you just don't feel like yourself. But I wanted to show the world and show men, women too, that you might feel depressed, but you are not depression. You might feel depressed, but you are not depression. Nobody wants to be a Debbie Downer, but I'll tell you right now, you will never heal what you don't reveal. Ask a smiling face, are you okay? Sometimes you gotta, 
So you got to show that pain so people can see it. Yes. Just this morning, young lady walked up to me and said, Mike, you all right? She said, you know why? Because they felt my energy. I wasn't that right because my anxiety is acting up right now. But I, I got a job to do. A long time ago, I said, you know what? If depression is going to occupy my head, like my mama said, you can't work. You can't stay nowhere rent free. So if this depression is going to occupy my mind, I'm going to put it to work. Come on! Depression is not a, a, a death sentence. No. I mean, a lot of people, I wasn't going to get off, all off into it. Go ahead, take 25 your time. years, I haven't been, on my best day, I've been 88%. But in that time, I wrote two top, I had two top 100 albums, a best-selling novel. Oh. I've done 10 movies, some have been on Stars, Hulu, all over the place. And I did that depressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going to say to anybody out here, anybody out here who's dealing with depression, yeah that you might feel depression, but you are not depression, right? And sometimes, you know, we try to tell our friends how we feel it, and they just won't understand because they haven't, they haven't felt it before. But I know that everybody has a purpose, and you gotta live in your purpose on purpose. Come on, Who here has a purpose? Who here has a purpose? Depression cannot red sideline that purpose. You gotta walk in your purpose, and you say, well, Mike, I'm going to do that, step by step. Come on. Through trial and tribulation. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you got to come up out of the stands and you got to get in the race. But yeah. depression right. can make you feel like a constant cheerleader, like I don't have what it takes to get in the race. So I'm just going to cheer for my son, cheer for my daughter, cheer for my friends. No, you got to get in the race. Cheer. You will never win a race that you don't get into. That's you right. will never get a medal if you didn't get in the race. So when you go to the starting blocks and you look it down and you say, man, how am I going to get there? All you, and you, let's just say it's no road. It's just you and it's the finish line and this is a bit. Take a step out on faith. God going to supply the rest of it. The universe, once you do something, the universe and God will conspire with you to make it happen. I, you know what? I just sat on the bed more than a few times and counted the two with full knowledge of what comes after two. I knew that somehow the universe is, is, is calling me to do something, so I stepped out on faith and I started doing these things. And man, now 25 years later, I remember telling myself, I'm gonna get it seven more days. If I don't feel better in seven more days, I'm out of here because it was just too pressing on my spirit. Seven days came, I said, I'm gonna give it one more day. One day came, I said, I'm going to give it one more day. That was 25 years ago. I take my life one second at a time. I take my life one second at a time. Because I know I have something to do because there is something after this. Who, believe, who believes there's something after this? I'm going to tell you all this quick story. The reason that we should uh, stand in our purpose and operate in our purpose is because when we leave this world, we know we're going somewhere. Are we in agreement? Yeah. So let me tell you all this quick story. So it's this king, right? The king had four wives, and on his deathbed, the king said, you know what? I don't want to go to the other side by myself. So he asked his first wife, now this was his most beautiful wife. She is the most beautiful wife in all the kingdom. Will you go to the other side with me? She said, I love you, but I love my life more. I can't go to you, with you to the other side. So he went to his second wife. Now. This is the wife he bought all the castles, she had all the gold, she had all the jewelry, right? He gave her so much stuff, he said, I know you'll go with me to the other side. I want you to go to heaven with me. She said, my king, I love you, but I too cannot go with you to the other side. So he went to his third wife, right? Now this is the one he stayed up all night with. They used to laugh, joke, and just have a good time, drinking, all of that. He said, will you go with me to the other side? She said, I won't go with you to the other side, but what I do, I throw you a party nobody will ever forget, and I'll make sure nobody ever forgets your name. So then his fourth wife, he didn't even look at her because he treated her like crap. He was basically mentally abusive, sometimes physically abusive, right? So she said, my king, I'll go with you to the other side. Where you go, I go. I'll go with you anywhere. Now his first wife, again, she was the most beautiful in all of the kingdom. Her name was Vanity. I don't care how you look, all these muscles, all those bodies, none of that is going with you to the other side. His second wife, who he bought the castles and the gold and the horses, her name was Possession. I don't care what you own, what you have, none of that is going with you to the other side. His third wife, she said, 
I can't go with you, but I'll throw you a party and make sure nobody forgets you. Her name was Friendship. See, your friends love you. They, they, they want to encourage you, but none of them can go with you to the other side. Now, in Paul's life, the one he was physically abusive to, the one he was verbally abusive to, but she said, where you go, I go. That's his soul. No matter what you do, it don't matter what you got, it don't matter who you are, the only thing you have is your soul. The reason I go around and I speak because I need my soul to be right for when I go, I'm going to where I need to go to. Right? And so I, I, I can't always be my best because depression won't let me always be my best. But I understand, again, I might feel depressed, but I am not depression, right? So as we go about our day today and every day, you gotta walk in your authentic truth. Yes. And it was hard for me to admit, to say a woman, I don't always feel in control of my emotions. Right. I'm not always the strongest yeah. man I need to be. Yeah, yeah. But if you wanna be the co-pilot on this plane, uh, uh, you, no, come on now. and you got a choice, you can be the co-pilot or you can be the passenger, I'm cool with both. Uh -oh. You can, you can, if, if you want to be the passenger, I'll talk to you all day. If you want to be the co-pilot, this is a part of my life. So yeah, you can't yeah. feel embarrassed. You can't feel shame. You can't feel down. You can't feel defeated. And, and that, all, that all is going to start with you loving yourself. One thing I know for sure, that I am loved, I am needed, and I am necessary. And I'm perfect in my imperfections. That all who know me are made better. And that's how you got to feel. You got to feel loved, needed, and necessary. But sometimes when you look in the mirror again, you like what you see, but you don't always like who you see. Come on right? now. And so, we, you know, I try to, I encourage people. One of the things I do, I advocate to get people to go talk to doctors or, you know, get on medication if, that, if that's what you need to do. And I say, you know, some, I take medication for my depression and anxiety. To me, it's like, uh, I can't throw the top, the table out, but I'm going to prop it up. This is what, I'm going to prop it up. I did 20 years without, med without medication and it felt like I was pulling a bus. Like, I did it, but I felt like the whole time I was pulling a bus. And so maybe that's not what you need to do. Maybe it's some spirituality, maybe it's some medication, but my thought is this. We all, you spiritual people, where I can tell, you're going to have to trust God for everything, go watch him for right. anything. That's right. You know, I mean, the same, you, you, don't, you don't pray out of backache. You don't pray out of toothache. You don't pray out surgery. You don't pray out, you take what the doctor tells you to give you. you this is it. And so, you know, I think medication sometimes has a, a, the wrong stigma, yes. especially when it's, you know, mental health medication. So, and anybody here who hasn't checked on their medication, let me just say, on their mental health, let me say this. We go to the optometrist, yes. even if our eyes seem fine, just to see yeah. if it's cool. We go to our primary to check on our insides just to see if it's cool. I'm not sick. I just want to prevent it. Yeah. Yeah. We go to every doctor. It ain't a man, woman, a child that's panic can tell me, be keep it a buck. You went to a mental health therapist just to see if you're okay. You know why? Because if I'm not okay, I already know the problem. Come on. My girlfriend. Uh-oh. My boss. My mama. My kids. Yeah. My job. The white man. I can find a reason why I feel depressed until one day I had to say, I've been in 10 relationships, a failed marriage, and the only constant is me. I've been in this job, this job, and this job, and the only constant is me. So sometimes you got to look in the mirror and take a deep dive, self-evaluating, honest look at yourself and say, listen, if I keep doing the same things over and over, that's insanity. I said I had to say, Mike, you are a problem. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do, to look at yourself. And look, it doesn't mean I'm a loser. It just means I'm not operating at my highest self. I'm not operating at my highest self, right? And so I can't use my depression as a crutch for everything. Trust me, I did. I, listen. Listen. I used it as a crush, but now I understand I can't use that as a crush. That's something I'm going through. I see these people with no legs, no arms, living their best life. Now, and I know people say, well, you know, it's people out there who got it worse than me. 
I wake up every day. Let's get it straight. Any day above ground is a good day. Do we agree? Yeah, right. I woke up this morning feeling depressed. I can't trip because, again, any day above ground is a good day. That's yeah, right. That's right. It's a fact yeah. somebody ain't wake up this morning. That's right. And it's a fact somebody not going to wake up tomorrow morning. That's right. But I'm here right now, and I'm able to build with y'all. I'm able to share with y'all. I'm able to pull inspiration. Like, this is like emptying out my cup. Because sometimes the pressure just feel like you want abundance. I'm going to give you abundance of this negative stuff in your life. So I got to empty that cup somewhere. And, 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 you know, if you're not careful, you be pouring it back on yourself. So I got to pour it into the universe, pour it into the people, man. And hopefully I can touch a soul. But somebody can go look in the mirror and say, I am loved, needed, and necessary. Perfect in my imperfections. And all who know me are made better. Now, if you got somebody who's dealing with depression, maybe you're not. Man, listen, it's a certain way. You, let me tell you what's not helpful. It could be worse. That's not helpful. Just snap out of it. What you got to be depressed about, that ain't helpful. It, it is not helpful. I know why you're doing it, but it's just not helpful. But at the same time, I cannot sit in my own, I carry my uh, depression around like, uh, what's that character on Charlie Brown? Like, with that dirty blanket? Because it has been a part of me so long that when I don't even feel the sad part no more. What I got is called thinking errors, like cognitive behavior, because you rewire your whole thinking. You do it to protect yourself. Let me tell y'all this. When I first started dealing with depression, people do things to, to bother me. Boom, I built a wall up to about my ankles. That way you can't trip me up. You know what I'm saying? So I got into a couple of relationships. Girls, you know, you know, you go in a bad relationship, it's like a punch in the gut. Guess what I did? What? Built the wall. Boom, this high. Guess what you can't do? Punch me in my gut, right? So I have people coming from my heart, coming from my neck. I'm going back to old behavior. What I do? Build the wall. Boom. I got people trying to get in my head, trying to tell me who and what I am. What I do? Build the wall. Boom. When, you, when, the, when the kings build castles, they build castles to keep who out? The killers, the robbers. But when the people from their own villages run into the wall, it's keeping them out too. So when I built this wall, I kept out all the negativity, but I also kept out the people who love it. But this is what I figured out. On the day I was born, I don't care who you is, on the day you was born, the universe, God gave you a hammer. It ain't even that big. It don't even have to be big, right? And it was up to me to knock this wall down. Knock Come this on. wall down. Because being dealing with depression, sometimes you like you feel like you're in a dark tunnel. We all so we what's the saying? What's at the end of the tunnel? The light. The light, but I can't tell you how far that is. That's right. I can't tell you how far that is. But I learned on the day I was born, the light ain't there, it's always been here. Come on! You can't be looking outside for anything. I will you will never find you will never find happiness in the eyes, arms, or words of another person. Come on! The best that somebody can do is amplify the happiness that you got. Come so on! When I was in this dark tunnel, I had to say, quit looking for the light. I got to light it up right here and right now. Because it's, very, it's a very real possibility. I've been walking in that tunnel 25 years. I've been walking in that tunnel 25 years. 25. But I had to tell myself, I'm going to walk in my tunnel lit. Uh, lit. Uh, lit. 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 My tunnel is lit. lit. Now, lit. if it's a brighter light down the tunnel, so be it. If it ain't, I'm good where I'm at. Yeah, this is yeah, what yeah. it has to be. Yeah. This is how I, this is what I have yeah. to tell myself, right? Yeah. Because I understand that depression is a disease. Yeah. Just like, like young lady said, like cancer, yeah. it's a disease. Yeah. And I know people yeah. like to throw it around and People like to misuse it. I'm not misusing it because it has affected every aspect of my life. Yeah. With the way I treat my kids, yeah. the way I treat women, the way I treat my mama, the way, and I had to really check myself and say, man, listen, you have an opportunity right now or a choice. Every day you wake up, you get two things, a chance and a choice. Yeah. So I had a chance and, I, and I, I decided to choose to be happy. I had to choose to fix these relationships. I had to choose to see something other than what I was seeing because I went a long time with glasses on that was dirty. So I saw the things everybody else saw, but it just wasn't clear. But I know through self-reflection, 
meditation, for me, medication, spirituality, my glasses are a lot clearer. I want to say I got 20 20 vision, but I don't need 20 20 vision to get through this life. I just need vision. So I'm going to close by saying anybody in here who feels they might be going through something, you owe it to yourself. If you feel it sad for more than two weeks, for more than two weeks. People say, well, Mike, how do I know if I'm depressed? This, this is the easy test. If you lose your job and then you lose your house, you might fall into oppression, depression, and we understand. You went through this divorce of after 20 years, you sad, and we understand. We, uh, 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 one of your kids is gravely ill, you depressed, we understand. But if you got plenty of money, you got a good job, you got a loving wife or a loving husband, you got a big house, you got cars, clothes, jewelry, trips, and you still sad, it's a problem. You need to go to a professional and have them not get to the branch, not get to the leaf, not get to the tree, Come but get to the root of the problem. Because if you don't get to the root of the problem, there is going to be a bigger problem. A lot of people try to get to the leaf of the problem, but I already know, cut the leaf off, guess what happens? Because you need to go to somebody. I ain't about to have nobody playing in my head. Come on! Everybody thinks that the psychologists, psychiatrists are playing in their head. You playing in your head. Come on! You playing in your That's head. Right. Anybody who hasn't seen a, a medical professional has made themselves their own doctor. That's a fact. You cap if you say you have. And again, and again, the cause of all depression for people who go undiagnosed is my girlfriend, my boyfriend. My job, money, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. Because you have to have somebody to play to blame on. I'm saying, blame it on yourself. Blame it on yourself, fix the problem, and move forward. You don't have to be perfect. You do not have to be perfect. The version of Mike I used to be is gone. That's that. I'm never going back to that. Uh, this is the version of Mike that the universe is put here right now. All right? So again, Every morning, this is what I want y'all to do. Repeat after me, I'm gonna close it out. I want you to look in the mirror and say, I apologize. I apologize. For everything I should have done. For everything I should have done. But have not done. But have not done. And I apologize. And I apologize. For everything I should have said. For everything I should have said. But I have not said. But I have not said. I know. Let's get it. So uh, a religion, a faith-based movie about free will. So both of them is streaming out. Yeah. Yes. Now, don't, don't look me up on that. Uh, nothing on Star. That's Ratchet Hood and stuff. Y'all won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> called um, a, a Grace and Mercy and State of Grace Mercy. and Mercy. I went to that red party event. Grace and Mercy. Yeah. And the a state of mind. A state of mind. A state of mind. Yeah. You can find that on Amazon Prime, Tubi. I'm telling y'all, you don't want to miss those two movies. And if you're in the movie making business, he is the man for the plan. You can find him on all platforms, social platforms. Mr. Mike Berry himself. One minute motivations. All right, let's give him a hand. Without further ado. I'm going to move along and introduce to you a councilman who I just met, but I love Mr. Twan Billings because Mr. Billings is always in their neighborhood. This month is Gun Violence Prevention Month. It's a Wear Orange Month. And if you don't know about that, um, the young lady that was at the Obama inauguration, she was shot and killed a week after she was there. 
And so we wear orange through the month of June because when the hunters are in the woods and you wear orange, you know not to shoot, right? So this is in honor of her, this is wear orange month. So Mr. Billings is very involved in gun violence prevention. He loves young people. He has worked with the ladies auxiliary. He have trained over 23 women in self-defense. He is involved with the Woman to Woman for Safety Forum. He has trained young men in all aspects of being great community leaders. Without further ado, I introduce to you Councilman Twine Billings. <laughs> How y'all doing today? I wanted to uh, definitely uh, thank Veronica and her husband for inviting me to come and speak to you guys. Um, I'm actually a councilman in the city of East Cleveland. Uh, I don't know, was you guys down there at the first location? And then y'all moved down here. Um, I'm a new councilman. Um, basically, I'm going to give you a pretty much an understanding of who I am and where I came from. Um, she stated some of the things that I was able to accomplish. Um, I came from, I was born here in Cleveland, I was raised in Los Angeles, and I moved up here in 1983. And uh, during that time, I was raised around, as you guys know, heavily gang involvement. And uh, so I had the best of both worlds, you know, and um, I don't really want to get too much in that lifestyle because uh, it caused a lot of problems in my life. But um, I came from an abusive background. Um, I had an opportunity to do a lot of great things when I moved up here to Cleveland. But before I got an opportunity to do those things, I was involved in, as I said, gang lifestyle. Um, I was the first one on American Most Wanted. So when she talked about gun violence, I was very much involved with a lot of different things. Um, but just, just to, you know, just keep it 100 with you guys, I introduced the Crips here in Ohio. And I was also on American Most Wanted, like I said. Uh, so a lot of people knew me from that background. And um, I did 13 years of, on a life sentence in the penitentiary. I've been locked up ever since I was a child. Uh, my mother developed breast cancer in, uh, what was that, 1986, I was locked up. 1988, I got locked up. The cancer came back. Uh, 1991, the cancer eventually took my mother. So during that time, I tried to change my life. I went through PTSD, depression, and everything. And I think I was at the time 18 years old. And eventually what ended up happening, hanging around the wrong people and keeping some of the fellas in my life, I ended up doing 13 years for something I didn't see, okay? Uh, during that time, I was locked up. I was in some of the worst prison, with the worst prison Ohio had to offer. And during that time of uh, me being incarcerated, um, I created a program in the prison system called Responsibility as a Man. I didn't realize that I was a, considered a high profile inmate, so they pretty much kept their eyes on me with what happened in the Lucasville riots. So they always looked at me as being pretty much a threat because I always had a bunch of people that followed up under me. You know, every time they incarcerated me, I kept spreading the movement around in different parts of the state. And that was a thing that the FBI and everybody else couldn't understand what was going on and how this hit Ohio so fast. Um, the key thing is uh, Mr. Charles C. had a program, many programs, community reentry. And in community reentry, he had multiple different programs that had came in to the prison system helping a lot of men and women that's incarcerated. And one of the programs that he had in his system, in his uh, system of community reentry, was called Friend of Friends. It was a guy by the name of Steve Messner. You remember Steve, Mr. C. So Mr. C created a program called the Red Coats, where he took inmates out and they went out and helped uh, senior citizens with food. And, you know, bags of food, helping them with shopping and things like that. Um, all the different programs he created, Mr. Messner took a liking to me, and that helped me, you know, with my depression because my family died during the time I was incarcerated. So it gave me an opportunity to say, hey, you know, which way I wanted to go in life. 
And when that time came about, how many of y'all heard of the singer Life Jennings? Y'all familiar with Life Jennings? Okay, so life is like a little brother to me. So me and him built a strong relationship with each other, and as a result of that, he's a multi-platinum artist. He out here doing all kind of different things and everything like that. But right now, I'm gonna talk to you guys about life choices. Um, give an example, like with life. Life made some some unique choices that caused him to lose a major record deal. I had made some choices that caused me to lose my life where it was 13 years on a life sentence. It was just a mir mirror of God that it let me out on my first parole, okay? You ask anybody on a life sentence, you don't get out on the first parole, you wanna at least do about 20, okay? Before you even talk about coming home from the penitentiary. This uniform, I purposely wore this uniform because this is the uniform that I wore for 13 years. 283729. I want you guys to look at this. Everybody in this room have made a bad choice and a bad mistake in your life. That's just period, okay? So I'm considered a felon, right? People was gonna judge you on your lifestyle. If you live in a bed, they say you gotta lie in it for the rest of your life because people are gonna judge you on just that. Many of you guys have seen a lot of that. I'm gonna I'm tell you also, I'm the first youngest concert bodyguard. I'm a seven year mixed martial art champ. So when she was talking about the training, I trained police departments, I trained SRT teams, I trained many women, I trained so many different type of people. I had the opportunity to look at things that God gave me. How many of y'all heard of the artist Babyface? Babyface was the one that pretty much is some of the singers that you guys hear to today was the one that was created the Atlanta movement. Babyface was the one that got me involved in the concert bodyguard work. And uh, I, I'm really privileged. I did it for Bobby Brown, New Edition, uh, Billy Idol, many, probably some of the artists you guys are going to be before your time. But at the end of the day, you know, it gave me an opportunity to have a different life. But I just was a hard head. I just kept going and kept going. So I'm saying this to say to you guys that when you make a bad choice, don't never let nobody tell you that you have to live in it. Because you're gonna make bad choices. You're gonna make bad decisions. You're gonna have people that's gonna be around you. I just spoke for several different friends that's currently still in prison, doing th they, but they got 33 years in. 33 years in. Some of them is actually innocent. They took the fall for their homeboys. And they still, you know, doing time. And the parole board, and that's the thing that people don't talk to you guys about. It's not just you doing time. Because when you do time, this come in. Your youth, you'll look at your picture and you'll look at your young face. When you're doing time, you're going to start seeing this. And then you're going to start going down. Your body and your mind is going to go down. All the rah-rah is going to go down. You're going to change. Because as they say, the brick walls don't break. But you will break before those brick walls. Some of these prisons been open before I was born, and they still in operation. So I'm saying that to say to you guys, when I came home in 2003, I struggled, I was homeless. I owned 10 cars, I owned three homes, uh, no kids, don't drink, don't smoke. I stay away from people. And now God had made me into a city council member, the first person with a convicted felon to be able to do that. Do you realize how hard it is, even your own people, your own race talk about you as a felon. And my crime was back in 20 years ago. That's how you have to live in it. I'm pretty much a strong-minded person. I mean, you know, many people know, you know, my mobilization capabilities. I was also involved with the largest motorcycle club, which is the zoos, maybe some of you guys know. But I was the spokesperson for that club. And I got my club out, we did a lot of community events, we did a lot of mediations, we did a lot of things in the community. All I'm saying to do to each and every one of y'all, I lost my mother to breast cancer and I regret everything that I did. Street work means nothing. Yeah, I got a lot of people that remember me from that background. And that kind of helps to keep the wolves away from me because they know what I used to be about. This right here, I wear pink because I remember my mother compared to this because I drove my mother up against the wall. I kept going and going and going. 
And being a man and being responsible is very important. It's easy to be a male, but it's hard being a man. I seen one of y'all with a child. Was that you? One of your the baby that was over there? Where's she at? Right there. So I want you guys to think about this. I have a book at home of young people I have worked with, with bullets in their head, uh, bullets all riddled through their bodies. That's the reason I don't carry a gun no more. Because I didn't realize what I was out there doing when I was doing stupid stuff like that. But when you look at a baby like that, and you out there feeling like you cause them, uh, you putting their work, and then don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's what you guys doing, because obviously that's not what you're doing. But guess what? Some of your homeboys, and y'all know homeboys that's out there pitting their work, right? So when they out there pitting their work, just understand that when you're living by the street code, there's a consequence behind the streets. There was a little girl by the name of Cookie that was shot over there on the Broadway area. Her father is a huge, big dude, street dude. He was down the street. Two dudes started off in a vehicle where one of the homeboys jumped in a truck and tried to rob the other guy for some weed. He robbed me, ran down the street, the guy went up under the street, he got the bus and they got the bus and back. The bullet went all the way down the street. Cookie was coming up out of the store and it hit her up at the top shoulder of her back. She went down the street to her friend's house and collapsed. The guy, when they were shooting back and forth, the one that did the robbing got shot in the lower back. He running down the street, ran around the corner. Her father was there with his homeboys. They heard the shooting. So when homeboy come around the corner, they tried to help him. So they like, hey man, don't doubt we got you. He took the gun, was looking for a sewer to try and get rid of the gun. So what he did, he took the gun and threw it right up under a porch. So the guys come running around the corner because they knew that he got shot. So they came around the corner, they like, man, forget dude, your uh, daughter shot. So they all went to his daughter. His daughter ended up dying, okay? And I just never forget that he said to me, he said, man, Twan, I had the gun in my hand that killed my baby. The three little girls that was murdered in East Cleveland. Y'all remember that? Any of you guys remember that? When three little girls was murdered and the guy took their bodies and just put them all around and just let them just in plastic bags. We as men has dropped the ball tremendously. And I can say for myself that I have. I try and educate everybody and try to tell them it's a difference between being a man and it's a difference between being a male. It's two different groups. And you got to understand the responsibility. Taking care of a child, being responsible, going to college, going to the military, doing things, that's street credibility. What I did is not street credibility. Don't never let none of those idiots. That hip hop music, y'all see, many of those guys are snitches and they ain't about that life. That's all acting. That's all it's about. I live that life. I'm telling you what it's about. I'm from LA. I'm able to tell you what it's about. I've been on America Most Wanted. I can tell you what that's about. I had ATL, FBI in my life. I can tell you what that's about. And what I'm telling you what it's about is not worth it. What it's worth is going to college, making you some money, taking care of your family, and don't get no felony charge. That is a typical way of them making money off of you. See a fool, use a fool. A man without a plan can be used by a man with a plan. And in life, that's how our life operates. People have plans, they make money off of ignorance. Understand that. The streets may be calling you and saying, hey man, come on, let's go out here and you know, hang out. Let's go drink some beer. Let's go out here and do this, that, and the third. Some young men just lost their life because one of their homeboys was drinking and he smashed into the wall and killed all of them. Some wet, one of the brothers down there smoking wet, he ended up shooting his homeboys in the back of the head and killing them, not knowing what he just did. I'm telling you, the streets don't love you back. The streets don't have no credibility. Denounce that lifestyle, denounce that mindset. College, military, and things that's going to build you, make you a stronger, better man and or woman. That's what this is about. You can talk to a man that made bad choices and mistakes. 
But I'm here to tell you to denounce that lifestyle and that mindset. If you got foolish thinking in your head, understand where it's gonna lead you to. And I'm here to tell you that it's not worth it and you ain't gonna like it being in a penitentiary. Now you may know some of these cats that's locked up right now, but I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, they ain't gonna tell you about the parole board. Ask any man that been locked up with the parole board, and they'll tell you that is the one deadly game that nobody want to mess with, especially if you got some time on your hand. Because they will continue flopping your butt. They'll tell you, you will walk right up in there. I'm going to give you the, the scenario. You got a few people that sitting behind the table. They looking at you. They'll have your file right there. You'll walk in after doing about 12 or on your 15 of life. You'll walk right up in there. You shake and you nervous because you want to be released. They'll say, ah, we ain't got your file. Come back in 30 days. You looking at your file right on the desk. So you go back. Then you come back after 30 days. They say, ah, you know we still ain't got your file. Come back in a year. You come back in a year. Now you got a ticket for getting extra food or maybe getting into a fight with your monkey. Then they say, oh my God, you're violent. You're like, well, I mean, I'm in the penitentiary. That's what's going to happen. I'm sorry, sir. Step off eight years. So it's like you're starting time over. So you come back, you do eight years. Then they'll say, you know what? Um, we as the board feel like, you know, you ain't did enough time that we feel like you penitentiary slick, et cetera, et cetera. Step off a super flop of 10 years. That's how this works. That's why I'm telling you, it's not real. Ask anybody, if you don't believe me, ask any OG that been in the penitentiary that actually did real time, ask them about that parole board. Ask them. It's easy when you got a felony on your record to get another one. The last thing I'm gonna say, domestic violence. Watch that. Any one of us can catch that by just arguing. You can get domestic violence by just arguing. Boyfriend, girlfriend, just arguing. If you in the wrong city and they want to do that to you, they can arrest both of y'all and charge y'all with domestic violence. That is unexpungible off your record. Am I lying, Mr. C? I got too many real stories to tell you one false one. I'm Twan Billings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Billings. Thank you, Councilman Billings. It was very nice. Guys, his message, make good choices. Good afternoon. Now good afternoon. Thank you to our Philo affiliates of Alpha Lab and Sigma Sorority Incorporated under the leadership of Madam Basilis Anita Laster Mays for allowing me to share with you a little bit about my journey from trauma and identifying my worth as a woman. So what is a woman of worth? To thoroughly examine this question, as a black woman, one must understand and acknowledge the intersectional experiences that I carry as a black woman in a society that often tells me that I'm not worthy enough of the simplest protections and respect. A world that tells me I'm too loud or aggressive when I challenge the status quo. A world that tells my hair or dress isn't professional enough but would tokenize my expertise when it suits them in the same professional settings. A world that would question my existence in spaces where I rightfully belong, all the while standing next to someone who should have even made it in a room. Again, I ask you, what is the worth of a woman and who gets to determine that worth? Sixty percent of black girls experience sexual violence before the age of 18. Incest is real in the African-American community. All too often, children who experience sex abuse are likely to be victimized again later in life. Approximately one in five teen girls have been physically or sexually abused by a partner. Teen pregnancy is often a result of child sex abuse. Black girls are 31% of the girls referred to law enforcement 
and about 43% of girls to have experienced a school-related arrest. Black women and girls represent about 30% of all women incarcerated, but only make up about 13% of the world's population. Survivors of sexual assault are 26 more times likely to abuse drugs, 13 times more likely to abuse alcohol, six times more likely to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, four times more likely to think about committing suicide, and three times more likely to suffer from depression. Comprehending my worth as someone reflected in all of the statistics I just shared with you has been complex and at times non-existent and even non more non-existent for little Teresa shown in this picture. Juvenile delinquent, that's what they called me. The trauma I experienced at a young age built a rage of anger inside of me that would explode at any given moment. I fought all the time, and I was pretty good at it. <laughs> Fighting gave me power because I had no control over what I was experiencing at a young age. I created this persona of being viewed as someone strong and capable of defending myself against anything. See, I started masking at a young age. This became my cover for my abuse. Masking for me meant not being my authentic self. Hiding and suppressing my reality in an effort to gain social acceptance and literally to just survive every day. My trauma response placed me in a Cleveland Christian home and later sent us to a year in Scioto Village, the juvenile state prison in Ohio. When Judge Betty J. Rubin declared me a juvenile delinquent, did my value as a young lady of worth decrease? I promise you, the world around me said yes, and therefore, I internalized that into my truth for years. I engaged in some of the most unhealthiest coping skills that led others to see me as fast, heathenish, disrespectful, unlovable, angry, and unworthy. And if I was sharing with you all today, if I had the time, I promise some of you would have thought the same in this room. However, I push past those stereotypes that are often associated with the statistics that I carry. I was never again involved in a criminal justice system as a juvenile and now provide professional education to that same system to ensure that 33 years later that they treat survivors engaged in the juvenile justice system differently and recognize the only reason why they're engaging in that system is because of the abuse that they have experienced. I knew I wanted better and I knew better started with me. And in our community, we don't believe in counseling. But counseling saved my life. Yes. Yes. Counseling is the reason why I'm here in front of you today. Yes. Unknowingly, I embraced the strong black woman trope at an early age. This is a myth that perpetrates the ideal that black women have inhumane toughness and are uniquely <laughs> indestructible. At the age of 13 years old, this meant that what didn't kill me would make me stronger. <laughs> Again, this was me masking. I watched my mother battle cancer for years. And during that time she battled cancer before she died when I was 19 years old, she showed up for everyone, did everything for everyone. And I always said, man, that woman is so strong. See, she got that from my grandmother. My grandmother passed that down to her. She got that from her great-grandmother. It's a direct relation to the trauma we have experienced due to the enslavement of black bodies in this country. But see, I wasn't built for that. I repeatedly heard that I was, that black woman and men in my life, the black church, the media, and society say how strong you are as a black woman. You've endured so much and you came through. But all the while, while I was living that, what I was living out loud was the impact of trauma, the impact of generational trauma, the impact of cultural trauma. I wasn't strong. I was surviving what I experienced. We have to drop the cape as black women. We have to drop the cape. 
We cannot afford to be everything for everyone. And until we drop that cake, we're going to have the highest rate of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and all of these other social ills that we carry as black women in this society. So, I often think about my inspiration for change. And my inspiration for change often came from these two young ladies, my daughters, Asia and Taylor. I wanted something different for them. I wanted them to experience something different. Well, when you are a young parent, I had my first child at 16 years old. When you are a young parent who've experienced all the things that I have, you're parenting through trauma. You're parenting your kids through trauma. Unknowingly, I indirectly pass my trauma to my children. I wanted perfection for them. Being a helicopter mom, making sure no one harmed them, making sure that nobody saw like, hey, your mom was a teen mom and then you're not gonna be, a, you're gonna be a teen mom, you're not gonna graduate, you're gonna do all this stuff. Unknowingly, I created a high level anxiety that my daughters live with to this day. I carry that trauma and I passed it on to them. And so that's why we have to heal. So we don't continue to cause harm within our own families and with our own selves. I, I, I started to change for them. I always say that my oldest saved my life and that my youngest gave me life. And I am because of them. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. So I had to have this shift. And when I created this shift in my life, I had to realize I needed to do things for me and not for others. Because if we do for others, it's a temporary fix. The kids grow now. So they're out of the house. And as I was going through my journey, I had to recognize that things that were happening in my life, I have to come over here because my um, computer just did something strange up here. I'm gonna stay right here. So the transformation of myself for my daughters wasn't enough. My value and worth sat with me, and I need to focus on myself in order for me to be the best version of myself so I could be a better version for others. The paradigm shift required me to do some heavy lifting, and I had to get dirty with myself. That's when most people stop going to counseling, when you have to get dirty with who you are and understand who you are. I leaned so heavily on that strong woman black trope that it was difficult for me even to lean into my femininity and my desire to be loved. I had to find value in myself in a way that others didn't see it. I hate when technology doesn't act right for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. It happens. I had to buy value myself so I can walk confidently in my femininity. I had to address the hurt little Teresa experience so, no, so she no longer hurt the adult Teresa. Because little Teresa was causing a lot of harm. Not only to myself, but to others. And had I not made this shift again, I wouldn't be here with you all. So God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. While being locked up in Scioto Village at the age of 14 years old, I learned the serenity prayer. And 33 years later, this is what I lean on every single day of my life. Oftentimes, we have laser focus on things that we have no control over. I couldn't control the things that I experienced, but now I knew I needed to be able to control how I shifted and responded to situations in my life. And when you focus solely on the things that you cannot control, you have little hope and little vision and have no full understanding about all the things that you actually have control over. I promise you, we have more control over things than what we don't. Come on, come on.
For decades, I sat in a woe is me state of mind, constantly focusing on the negative things and asking God why. Questioning God's love over me instead of saying that God put me through it to be a beacon of light for others. I am right now today the first black female to run a standalone rape crisis and domestic violence program in the state of Ohio. All right. The road traveled to get here today was rough, but I traveled a thousand times to experience and bear witness to the joy, the peace, and the love that lives within me. So, what are the concepts that I used? So for me, it was mental wellness support. Again, I am a lifelong person that would be in counseling. And it's not because I'm broke. It's because I always need a tune-up. I'm gonna always need a tune-up. Regardless of the things I've experienced, I'm gonna always need a tune-up. So you know how we go to our physician once a year for a checkup? I'm gonna encourage you all, if you haven't engaged in counseling, start going once a year for a physical, a mental wellness check. Well, well. For those who have not had kids or still have kids, get your child used to going to see a mental health professional at a very young age. Everybody needs help, everybody needs support. So make it a norm. And then love yourself abundantly with grace and forgiveness. And when I say give yourself grace, healing isn't linear. So think about a spiral that's going up and down. So when you go down, a lot of times we beat ourselves up because we slipped. But if you stay the course, you're gonna propel back up. And you're gonna go down and you're gonna propel back up. It's a constant going down. And when you go down, you learn something about yourself. You learn how to maneuver the next time when you're in that situation. Yes, yes. So remember, healing isn't linear. It's going to take time. It's going to require you to love yourself with grace and patience and abundantly. And then the other thing of it is, one of the things I had to figure out on my journey was, I couldn't depend on no man, my mama, my daddy, my kids to give me joy. It's no one's responsibility to give you joy. It's no one's responsibility to give you peace. That lies within self. You have to have love for self. You have to understand that your worth, your value lies within you. And although some people would try to dictate what it should look like and how it should feel, and if we continuously listen to others, We'll never get to a place of self. And then again, and I always say this, focus on what you can control. I can't control how other people see me. I remember when I first started talking loudly about my survivorship, I had friends whispering in my ear, saying, we don't talk about that. That's not for you to talk about out loud to others. And imagine if I would have listened to how I should survive and tell my story of where I would be today or where I wouldn't be today. Again, focus on what you can control, and that is the self. And then get you a personal board of directors. Every successful business has a board of directors standing behind them, guiding them. I have built up a professional board of directors that helped me in my personal life, and it helped me in my professional life. Do I agree with them all the time? Hell no. But I know that I chose people that's always going to have my best interests. And like any board, people can get repositioned. And they should have term limits at times. Because everybody may not travel with you on your journey every day. And so for me, when I started walking in my truth, when I became a healed version of who I am today, I literally had one of my best friends since junior high school say, you fake. This isn't real. I know the real you. And I said, no, you knew the hurt version of me. You knew the unhealed version of me. And just because I experienced all these horrific things in life don't mean I had to live like that. And when I made that mental shift, 
Some people got left behind. Some family got left behind. And I promise you, if my children weren't who they were, they would have got left behind. <laughs> Sometimes we have to make decisions that nobody else will ever understand. And it's okay because again, you have to focus on what you can control. You can't control what other people feel about you. And that was the thing I had to get in my head as I was on this journey. And then the other thing is be present, live, and rest. Be present. <clears throat> be present. And the reason why I'm saying that multiple times, often we're not present. We're somewhere else. We're scrolling on our phones. We're on social media. We're not paying attention to the things around us. Being present allowed me to feel the emotions that I was feeling. Being present allowed me to feel the joy that I didn't even know I was experiencing within. Live. Get your list of things you want to do in this lifetime and start crossing them off. Living for today will allow you to live for tomorrow. Rest is an act of reparations. No is a whole sentence. Drop the strong black woman trope. Drop the cape. You owe nothing to no one but yourself. And I know people are like, but we're families, we're Christians, we have to do all this stuff. No, you don't. No, you don't. I watched my mother die because of that. Yes, yeah, she had cancer, but she died because she was doing everything for everyone else and she never rested. Rest is an act of reparations. So again, I ask you, what is a woman of worth? When I determine my worth, added taxes with the cost of inflation. <laughs> my worth is something I get to determine, not my past. Every woman is a woman of worth. We don't need to know her story to deem her worthy. She could be Cardi B or Michelle Obama, and we should treat her the same. We should give her the same level of respect, the same level of love, the same level of protection, regardless of how she show up, because you don't know the story behind her why. And like I said, if I sat here and told you all of the things that I've engaged with, I'm pretty sure people would judge me for that. But however, you have to understand what I was dealing with on a daily basis. So when we're talking about protecting a woman, we need to love her with our words and our actions, protect her with our words and our actions, affirm her with our words and our actions, help her get to this place where she deem herself worthy and help others to see that she too is more precious than diamonds, more precious than rubies. But I warn you that this may look different for everyone. It's not gonna look the same because no diamond is cut the same. I can only imagine how much more I could have accomplished if others would have saw me as worthy. For that one arrest that I had as a juvenile for fighting, if Judge Betty J. Rubin would have said, you know, why is this honor roll, straight A, major work student, acting out? Instead, what she saw was this young, educated black girl from a middle-class family who shouldn't be in a position she was in, so she punished me for that. Just imagine if we would have shifted the trajectory of that. But it's okay, because I'm still here. That's right. I'm wrapping it up. So, when we're talking about operating in love, when people are their most unlovable is when they need the most love. Yes. So what is your response when you encounter that young lady or woman who society may deem as unworthy, unlovable, or broken? Remember the serenity prayer. Focus on what you can control. You may not have the ability to control the person's actions, but what can you control? You can control by operating in love. 1 Corinthians 13 defines what love is for us. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envy. It is not boast. It is not proud. It is not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always, always has hope, and it always perseveres. When people, again, are their most unlovable is when they need the most love. Loving someone doesn't mean you have to like their behaviors or their actions or agree with the things that they're doing. We can't afford to continue to internalize the harmful stereotypes that are projected about us and put them onto others. We're no different than them when we do that. So I ask you, what can you control? How can we get to a point in society instead of saying, what's wrong with you to what happened to you and how can I help? We have that as women, an opportunity to continue uplifting women in our society. We have the ability to change the trajectory of lives by just extending love. It is the easiest act that one can do. Statistically speaking, 60% of black girls experience a sexual assault before the age of 18. For every one that reports a sexual assault, 15 don't. 40% of the FBI's identified human trafficking victims are young black girls and women. So if I'm going statistically speaking, I know there are many survivors in this room today. Know that I see you, I believe you, and it's never too late to heal. It's never too late to heal. And so when we're talking about healing, just know that this is what it looks like. I can stand on my truth. I can say out loud things that I never said before. I can call out injustices for others. I fight hard for the underdog because I know that when one person believes a survivor, that when one person can say, hey, I believe you, those are the strongest words a survivor will ever hear. I believe you. How can I help you? And for those who haven't decided that, you know, life is rough and I just haven't had an opportunity to heal. There are two organizations in Northeast Ohio the Cleveland Ray Crisis Center, and the organization I'm in charge of, the Hope and Healing Survivor Resource Center. Check them out if you need to, if you need a friend. But I just want to end, I apologize about the tech issues, but I want to end with two things. I'm here today because I went to counseling. Prayer is not enough. Faith without works. Faith without works. Prayer is not enough, folks. Because trust and believe, I've been a praying woman all my life because of my mama. I had to step back and get some additional help and support. And the second thing is, extend grace to others. Extend grace. Just think about when you were at your lowest. What were the words you needed to hear? What were the words? I love you. I believe in you. I believe in you. I'm here for you. Come on. Stay strong. I support you. So the next time you run across that sister that needs that help, don't just say those words. Show the actions that go behind them. We don't need words. Words aren't enough. We need people to actively, actively do what they say they're going to do. Again, I'm alive today because I went to counseling. It's never too late. And maybe your, my trauma is not your trauma, but we all have trauma of some sort. And before I turn this over to the men in the room, there was a young lady on TikTok. She was a black counselor. She told black men to go to counseling. No, nah, that's not all right. They attacked her with a vengeance I have never seen before. They caught her job, they got her fired. All she said is she wanted black men to go to counseling. And if we could just go into counseling and talk to people, you know how much stronger as a community we could be as black folks? I always say we kill the patriarchy, we can tackle racism together. But she was attacked at a level that was unheard of because all she said was go to counseling. 
Counseling don't hurt nobody. It don't hurt nobody. It's the greatest gift we can give to self. No matter what you've been through, you can heal. But you have to do the work to make it happen. I have my counseling session next week on Wednesday at three o'clock. And I got a list of things I need to talk to this lady about. It's okay. Again, I'm here because I went to counseling. Healing can happen. Regardless of how old you are, you can be 60. You still got to live for tomorrow. It's never too late. Thank you. Uh, one thing I forgot, sorry, um, sore. one thing I forgot, I, I know that the conversation, maybe not in this moment right now, some of you all may leave out of here and go home and sit on your couch, lay in your bed, and thoughts, past experiences may come flashing back. It typically happens because it happened to me one day when I was first uh, working in the field. If that happens, don't get scared. Just pick up the phone and call the hotline. The hotlines at the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center and at the Battle Women's Shelter Rape Crisis Center, some in Medina County, is available 24 7. Just call the hotline and somebody on the other end will be able to speak with you. But I just wanted to be mindful that the information was heavy. And if anyone needs to talk, I'm here, and I'm gonna put my Sora Wilson out. Uh, she's a licensed clinician. Um, she's in the room too for you as well. Thank you. Thank you.